author of Women of Color in Tech, a book that seeks to inform and inspire women of color to pursue careers in tech in a variety of different sectors, including uh, careers in civic tech. I'm truly honored and excited to be serving as moderator for this afternoon's discussion and to be joined by many wonderful and accomplished leaders representing nonprofits, government, and industry. All the panelists that are with us today are deeply committed to bring more civic-minded technologists into the workforce. Before we start, uh, a few housekeeping items. Uh, please utilize the Q&A feature if you have a question for any of the uh, panelists. Uh, be sure to include the name of the panelist if your question is for a specific individual. Um, otherwise, I'll make the assumption that this is an open question for anyone that is on here. Um, we will have a formal uh, Q&A discussion, but please feel free to go ahead and ask questions as uh, things come up. Uh, panelists, as a reminder, I will direct questions to you as we go through the discussion. And if you'd like to ask a follow-up question, uh, just be sure to mention the panelists that you are addressing. Uh, with that, our discussion today seeks to establish the need for public interest technologists across several sectors. Technologists, both in the US and worldwide, are needed to help governments, social service providers, advocacy groups, and many other sectors to use technology to find ways of working and confront and address the challenges and inequities that inevitably arise with technological innovation. We're going to touch on a variety of different topics, including how we can better create career pathways for students, barriers that we will need to overcome, and how we can ensure that we are building a diverse and inclusive talent pool. Uh, with that, I'd like to now formally introduce our wonderful panel. Uh, Georgia Bullen is the Executive Director at Simply Secure, an organization that helps practitioners design technology that centers and protects vulnerable populations. Georgia is also the chair of the advisory committee at Measurement Lab, a project that provides the largest collection of open internet performance data on the planet. She has been an advocate in the internet health movement through her work and passion around issues such as net neutrality, security, privacy, and equitable access to technology. Georgia previously served as a director of tech projects at New America's Open Technology Institute. Robert Demansky is the New York City government's director of higher education for the Mayor's Tech Talent Pipeline Industry Partnership. Rob oversees the CUNY 2X Tech Initiative. This initiative, a $20 million investment in the City University of New York, seeks to grow New York City's tech workforce by doubling the number of graduates with tech bachelor degrees by 2022 increase the employability of such graduates to grow the local pool of high quality diverse talent and increase the rate at which the New York City tech industry consistently draws from this pool of talent in their hiring practices. Rick Kempinski is the senior manager of federal workforce programs at the Partnership for Public Service, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to inspire a new generation of civil servants and to transform the way government works. Rick leads the partnership's internship and fellowship strategy and manages several key programs, including the Cybersecurity Talents Initiative, the Call to Serve Innovation Internship Program, and the Harold W. Rosenthal Fellowship in International Relations. Travis Moore is the founder and director of Tech Congress based at the Open Technology Institute at New America. Tech Congress connects Congress to technology talent, training, and ideas, and organizes the Congressional Innovation Fellowship. And finally, Dr. Stephanie Rodriguez serves as Vice President of Policy and Engagement at AnitaB.org, a leading voice for women in technology across the globe, where she advances policy for workforce access, equity, and inclusion. This includes a new initiative called the United States of Technologists, an effort to drive a surge of 10,000 technologists working toward the public good in local, state, and federal government. She's a longtime volunteer in education, literacy, and mentorship programs. 
panelists, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, allow me to kick off by directing my first question uh, to Travis. Uh, Travis, uh, what do you think is the one thing that people get wrong about public interest technology or about the pit ecosystem in general? I think so. Um, it's great to be here with with everyone, um, and thanks for having me. Uh, so, Suzanne, I would say uh, I think the thing I come from a government perspective, um, having served in government and op operating a fellowship in government, and I think the thing that um, people get wrong is just how entrepreneurial these roles are. Um, Congress, for example, is 535 different small businesses. Um, and these are teams of 20, 30, like 40 max. And so when you end up as a public interest technologist on this team, that's generally speaking only otherwise populated by lawyers or public policy, um, folks with public policy backgrounds, you have a perspective that's not otherwise available and you know what you don't know. Um, so you can do extraordinarily entrepreneurial and impactful things. So to use a couple examples, we had a fellow organize the first hearing on facial recognition technology back in 2017. Um, we had a fellow introduce the first bill in Congress to um, allow defendants to have access to algorithms that are used in a criminal justice setting um, uh, for uh, evidentiary uh, purposes. We had a fellow get the Open Government Data Act signed into law. And that's because they're able to bring these skills and expertise to government and, and really pave pave away. And so um, I think we shouldn't think of government as, as bureaucratic because, I, because um, there is a ton of opportunity w w for folks that have this skill um, to really chart new paths. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think it's really important to really understand how, um, you know, diverse and, and all of the different things that we can you know, get involved in when it comes to public interest technology um, and really, you know, getting people to, to understand that. Um, anyone on the, on the panel have any additional thoughts? This is Rick. Uh, I just want to add that I think um, one one thing to think about is that there are technology opportunities, at least from my perspective on the federal uh, government side, throughout the entire country. So folks do not have to only look at opportunities within the uh, DC area. There's also opportunities for recent graduates and students where they're located, uh, where they're going to school right now in, in the state, although on a federal uh, government level. So just be looking uh, for opportunities and have them look for opportunities if they're thinking about you know, a career in public service and, and more on the federal government side of what's going on in their own area uh, for the federal government. So something to be thinking about as well. I just jump in and add, um, I think another piece that I always like to make sure we talk about is that technology isn't just someone who studied computer science and <laughs> went into coding and is doing the like making and writing of this of software. Um, I mean, lots of things we use every day are technology. <laughs> uh, like paper is technology, pens and pencils are technology, sticky notes are technology. Um, and so to have really successful technology work, you actually need people from diverse backgrounds who are thinking about the many facets of the way technology is entering our systems and the way that the, the systems are interacting as a whole. So it's much more um, socio-technical approach to things. Uh, I manage a design nonprofit, and I think you know one of the gaps we see a lot is actually that there are very few people with design um, or community backgrounds that are working on technology projects and how critical that is to actually the success and thinking about needs and engaging with community as part of that process. I think Thank you. I would just oh, add sorry. that, you know, I'm not sure that people get this wrong, but I think perhaps it's underappreciated, which is the transferable skills and relationships that you build when you work in public service through government and what that means when you do or don't leave that role. And so I think we talk a lot about the incredible value of lifelong civil servants. And there's another incredible value of having experts in the public sector who understand how government works and understands how to work with government players so that when they're back in their private sector roles, we can still accomplish really innovative and effective public-private partnership strategies that are also super, super important for government to execute some of its core functions. And 
sometimes I think that the the learning and the trans the transformative skill sets that you develop through government service can sometimes also be an underappreciated value. Stephanie, thank you for, for bringing it up. I wanted to ask a, a follow-up question. Uh, when it comes to uh, you know having more of that government interaction, what kind of uh, barriers do you think that we need to over overcome to you know kind of get more of a, of a stronger partnership? I can take a stab at, at that one, Suzanne. I think um, some of the barriers are just in connecting and being engaged. So I know um, when I first entered government, I was super nervous. I didn't have a lot of experience advocating as a citizen because I just wasn't really very active. So even really understanding how um, the different branches of government work together was a learning curve for me. And so I think there's something to be said about general civic engagement, um, helping to sort of bridge some of those gaps between how public and private sectors are working together um, so we can identify those opportunities a little bit um, more efficiently um, for where for where lovers can be pulled and where subject matter expertise is welcome and all of the myriad ways that you can deliver that expertise um, inside and outside of government. Thank you for that. Uh, Georgia, I had a question for you, um, and you, you kind of spoke about that in your, your previous response. Um, when it comes to um, you know, developing these programs, what kind of um, challenges have you encountered, and um, what are opportunities where, uh, for growth or for potentially um, overcoming those challenges? Yeah, I think, I mean, a lot of it is what Stephanie was also just talking about, like those communication gaps and actually the facilitation and organizing needs. I think a lot of times, a lot of the projects we work with, um, we find, know that there are problems with the tools or the system or the program that they're building. They're not really sure how to identify what they are, or they've heard complaints from people and they're not really sure how to synthesize that or how to facilitate like learning more. And so we, a lot of what we do is work with people to help them build processes that are about getting that feedback, creating those feedback loops, um, communicating and just having a more open process that allows for people to all be heard and all, all of the issues to be understood. I think a story that I um, tell from one of my first jobs, I was working in a software company and uh, I was a part of the design team and someone came in and they said, you know, I was working with the users at this like one client site and um, I filed this issue, but we should change it so that the background of everything in our software is white. And I was like, what is the context of what they're doing? <laughs> like, tell us more about that. What we found out was that the, the group, when she expanded on it, what we found out was that the group using our software um, actually was using it for presentations. And so their whole thing was that they wanted all of the PowerPoint features because that's what they were used to and that's the context they're used to working in. So it wasn't just that we needed to change a color and like directly respond to the way the complaint was. We kind of, we really needed to understand the context, which meant asking more questions, sort of working with people to see what they were actually struggling with and, and create that feedback loop so that we could instead provide customization, right? And that's, that's like a very um, tactical example <laughs> about like a software feedback process, but I think the same can be applied to, to program designs, right? And if you look at any of the programs that all of us here work on, a lot of what we're trying to understand is how do we um, help support exploring challenging questions that are coming up in so many intersectional facets of our community and society, right? It's not just like, oh, we need to figure out how we deal with the internet. It's like the internet is everything now. So we need to understand how all of these systems come together, what the problems are, what the needs are, and, and work together to solve those. No, absolutely. Um, any additional comments from the panelists? I can weigh in on, uh, I think, um, some challenges, uh, which is um, which we, we felt um, pretty acutely at, at the beginning, which is it requires on the level of government to bring in a public interest technologist, uh, a degree of maturity on behalf of the staffer or the principal, um, when you are going to them and you're saying, you know, these are incredibly hardworking, um, mission-driven, under-resourced 
folks. Um, part of the part of the pitch that you're making to them about why they should take on a technologist is um, is yes, you are wonderful, um, but we also think that you could use some help here. Um, you you have a blind spot, um, which is uh, a, a knowledge or understanding of technology. That requires a, a real level of maturity on behalf of um, of the of the government staffer, and and for that reason, you know, our focus as an organization has always been go to um, go to the evangelizers, go to the members of Congress, go to the staffers that already are deep believers in the use and future of technology and that want more tools in, in their toolbox. So if I think about opportunities, it's, it's about identifying those individuals in other governments. Um, you know, also, especially, we talk a lot about executive branches, we're in legislatures. The judicial branch is a completely blank slate here. Um, there is virtually no one working in the judicial branch context to think about um, improving court systems or access, access to expertise and decision making um, uh, for judges. So um, huge opportunities there and the evangelizers exist. The challenge is we have to find them and we have to work with them and we have to understand their unique challenges and, 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 um, and, and then do that matchmaking. And this is Rick. I just want to add, I'm on the exec, more on the executive branch side, so I can kind of speak to that. And by well, as we were setting up the Cybersecurity Talent Initiative, I can say I, I agree with Travis. Um, we had to find the champions who really understood that um, set, finding entry, especially our, our program is entry level specifically. Um, and a lot of folks want uh, talent that is has many, many years of experience in technology that just probably there aren't that many people who have that experience quite yet. And really we want them to take on um, this entry level talent, develop them and build those pipelines uh, for the future uh, to build up those, those future cyber leaders. Um, and it's taken a little bit of a time to get them to understand that, um, that our program is offering multiple ways to develop them. They're not alone in that process, um, but we want to help them develop folks um, by giving them technical training, professional development training, in addition to the on-the-job training that the agency is providing. Um, and so we're all in this together to help build those uh, technologists to be the future uh, of folks. And then obviously our program is also cross-sector opportunities. So they're gonna spend two years in the federal government and then be invited to apply to one of our private um, company organizations. So they're gonna be very marketable to, uh, to those companies by the, all the training that they're getting uh, in their first two years in the public sector. Um, and then they're building their networks that is gonna be beneficial to the private companies as they're thinking about how to work uh, more closely and effectively with the federal government. So things uh, I think are looking up. I think uh, the program is launched. We're really happy with our first cohort and we're hoping that um, through building these technologists we can uh, get even more technologists in the federal government. If um, I could jump in, this is Rob. Uh, so following up on Rick's comment, it really gets to the heart of the question of what qualifies one to be a public interest technologist, right? And what type of training, what type of education do we really view as being essential to qualifying for that type of title as distinct from just a technologist period? Um, at the core of it, when we start talking about like workforce development, um, it really, it's impossible to imagine how um, feeding into curriculum, and again, I work in higher education, but um, uh, without, you know, focusing and targeting curricular changes and incorporating a lot of public interest tech principles, frameworks, theories, and the actual tools used by practitioners into curriculum, then uh, really that's what I think is essential to, you know, training the next generation of technologists to be public interest technologists. I certainly agree. And so... What what are what are ways that um, we can help in in that regard? What what are ways that uh, uh, Pitt or other organizations? How can we help build those those next uh, level of technologists? Uh, Robert, following up with you. Sorry. Ah, uh, well, first of all, if the goal right, there's always this definitional problem with public interest tech. If the goal is training the next generation of technologists, then, and again, um, I come from a certain sector, uh, but 
if that is the goal, training the technologists, then we do need um, to put a focus on supporting the technology education, right? Uh, and yes, that means computer science departments, computer information systems departments, and so on. Uh, those are the folks that will be the software engineers uh, in a few years and in the years to come. And so it's really a matter of supporting those departments, making sure that students uh, of all backgrounds are getting through towards their degree completion, ultimately getting internships and jobs. And by supporting that pipeline, as you said, Rick, um, that's really how we can inject a lot of these values, a lot of these thought considerations uh, into curricula so that ultimately all these future technologists are getting that education. Thank you. Uh, and so to actually follow up on that, Rick, um, one of the questions I had for you was um, in, in terms of uh, diversity and equity and, and, and inclusion, um, you know, what, what are some things, uh, methods that we, we could be to making sure that this pipeline not only has, you know, the technological still, skill, but it is representative of, you know, the diverse public that we're, that we're serving? Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I'm really proud of the work that CTI did in this arena. We, for our first cohort, um, were above the national average in a lot of the demographic um, groups for our first, uh, first uh, throughout the entire process of our first group from application to applicants to finalists to participants. Um, we did a lot of outreach to um, HBCUs and Hispanic serving institutions. We worked really closely with several um, membership and student organizations um, to really get the word out there and to have a diverse group of folks apply to the program. Uh, we really targeted um, not only uh, those groups, but also non-traditional uh, colleges and universities. So a lot of online uh, schools, uh, less so, you know, uh, places like Western Governors University, um, to really get the word out there that, um, and think about people who are not only um, early in their stage in their career, but also um, maybe have been in the workforce for 20 years and are doing a career change, uh, for example, uh, or even veterans who um, are looking to come back and really focus on um, uh, cybersecurity in particular. Um, and so we were just really happy with that. So just really making sure that you're casting that wide net and really targeting um, folks that you kind of want to make sure that the, the pool itself is really diverse. Uh, I'm really, I'm open to other, other thoughts on that from the, from the panelists, but we, the way that worked for us for at least for our first year was really successful and we're really happy with the, with the outcome. I think one strategy that we're taking is to make sure folks know about the opportunities that exist. So um, it's, it is wild, like you don't know what you don't know. And, it, and it's kind of wild um, how insular knowledge about some of these amazing pathway programs and opportunities really can be. So if you're in a technical training program and you didn't have, you know, Rick come visit you, um, like, like happened to me when I learned of one of these policy programs, um, then, then how would you know that that's even a pathway that is available to you? Um, and so at anita.b.org with the United States of Technologists, our, one of our main goals with that effort is to really be a hub of information and almost a one-stop shop, if you would, for information and resources on where you can find opportunities in public interest technology and tech, where technologists who are interested in serving in government can identify those opportunities along with resources to make you more competitive along those application processes. So uh, it's it's pretty different, right? Using your computer science background to land that, that software engineering job at a corporate entity than it is to get inside uh, navigateusajobs.gov. And so really making sure that folks understand what is expected and how to navigate some of those mechanisms um, while at the same time working to make those mechanisms a bit more inclusive. Um, I think it's a multi-pronged approach. I'll just, I would, to jump in and um, add, I totally agree. I feel like I spend a lot of time, just as much as I can on my personal time, either reposting jobs at other places, <laughs> trying to like reach out to people directly. Uh, I used to do it individually. I actually just started my own mailing list to send things out. I think, um, I mean, I know Travis runs one as well from the tech Congress community. There's a few different sites. I've tried to like aggregate the lists and get those out to people that I know that jobs get posted on. And I know that that's still one that's like as individuals 
doing that's never going to be enough. I think now that I'm also in a position where I'm running a small nonprofit, part of what I would love to see and what I've been trying to do is figure out how to navigate the programs that universities offer so that I can actually hire students as interns or do things that are coursework related. Um, we've done this a little bit with uh, Berkeley now, and I still don't really know that we're navigating it well. <laughs> I would love to be able to, you know, I have, a, I have an eight person team, so it's also really hard for me to necessarily go and sign up for every university's program. And a lot of them are pretty different. So someone had pointed me towards Harvard has a job site for their MBA students for that might want to work in public interest instead. And I'm, I'm on there and I can post things. No one's ever applied to them. I don't really know how to frame it for them. I don't know the program super well. So it's hard for me as a small nonprofit lead to navigate that. Um, but a different one that we've actually had work really well is uh, we work with the NYU Business Transaction Law Clinic. And that's been really great to get connected with students that are, I mean, they're getting to learn about our technology work that we're doing and sort of human rights work that we're doing, civic tech work that we're doing, um, but they're coming out of a law program. And that, you know, people are gonna come from different backgrounds. Nonprofits need all kinds, all kinds of help <laughs> and we're a great learning space. And I would love to see a way to better connect those dots that um, actually helps nonprofits navigate the university ecosystem because it is, large and hard, <laughs> so I would say. Um, but I'm happy to help give people that work experience uh, and can pay them many in uh, many contexts. So it'd be great to, to know how to get connected to more people who wanna do the work. Um, I'd like to plus one everything Georgia just said. And really the theme uh, we're all discussing right now is focused on uh, individual opportunities, whether internships or hiring. Uh, I do think it's worth mentioning um, what an opportunity there is on this front as well in terms of institutional selection. So for instance, uh, when potential funders, when nonprofits, you know, even um, different governmental actors consider what institutions they should be funding for these types of efforts. I think institutional selection really should matter, right? Um, we want funders to be reaching out to HBCUs, right? Uh, we know that, um, again, I work for the New York City government and the City University of New York has 80% of all of its students are from minority or underrepresented groups. Fully 42% of its students come from households making less than $20,000 a year in income. And, you know, typically a lot of opportunities tend to be offered towards the more well capitalized, you know, colleges and universities. And yet if a more conscious, conscious decision was made more frequently to invest and provide opportunities to some of these institutions, I think we see a lot of progress being made. Yeah, and if I can weigh in from the organizational perspective, one really um, fantastic opportunity is that we are all running programs that didn't exist six years ago. So much of the problems around diversity, equity, and inclusion are seem to be based in, in inertia, old ways of hiring, old ways of recruiting. Um, we know how to solve this problem. Project Include um, out of the Cape Core Center has a playbook um, and it's got like 80 recommendations for things that you should do to build a diverse, equitable, and inclusive organization. So when we started Tech Congress, we just took that playbook and we adopted it from, from day one. And I'm proud to say um, to date, over 40% of our fellows um, are people of color, over 30% are vets. Um, to Rick's point, huge opportunity with veterans. And so we set um, a goal that 51% of our outreach, this, Georgia has been a huge help here, but 51% um, of our outreach, every recruitment cycle would go to um, communities underrepresented in the tech community um, that uh, we adopted the, uh, the first in Washington or in politics, a diversity uh, referral award, which was um, one of five interventions that the Cape War Center says um, are, are significant in terms of um, in, improving your DEI and your organization. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, we publish our metrics every recruitment cycle. Um, and we talk openly about how we are trying to learn when it comes um, to DEI. So I, I think there's a huge opportunity for all of us programs. And for those of you at universities, those of you starting programs at universities to just bake it in from day one. And, and again, I wanna point people to, to Project Included. It is a great, great resource. Um, last thing I will say is uh, I'm gonna give a plug because Georgia mentioned it. 
for those that are interested in policy opportunities and you're technical, we have a, we have a resource, a jobs list. Um, if you go to techcongress.io slash resources, um, you can sign up for it. It's a monthly newsletter. It's specific to, you know, I'm studying computer science or engineering or informatics and I wanna go work on data privacy or facial recognition or algorithmic accountability. Um, we think it's important to have a, a specific, you know, uh, job list for, for those folks. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I actually want to circle back to um, a theme that um, Georgia uh, brought up uh, earlier, um, and, and it's talking about um, you know getting that vis visibility into all of these opportunities, um, not have it be so uh, kind of siloed or you know kind of tribal knowledge, like really building this awareness of uh, public interest technology uh, careers as well as as training. Uh, so, uh, Robert, I actually would like to ask this question to you. Um, what are some ways that we can, uh, I guess, greater uh, solidify um, the visibility of uh, public interest technology careers? Sure. So every institution is going to be different. Um, I would start out, I would recommend by targeting university systems. So, for instance, uh, large state systems. Um, we have the State University of New York, the City University of New York, each of which has, um, you know, well over a dozen different colleges within it, and um, kind of promoting and making connections with uh, both the administration and the faculty at those institutions, uh, I think would go a long way. If I can add, this is Rick. When we did uh, our first round of CTI recruitment, um, just to underscore what Robert said, um, we found out through our evaluation and our metrics that the way that a lot of our applicants found out and students found out about it was through faculty. So getting to them directly was uh, is definitely um, something that we need to be doing um, even more of uh, so that students know about it. I think also um, having faculty and career services just understanding that a career in public service is a very viable career, that it is something along the same line as going through academia or going to a, the private sector. Um, so we, we, need, we need that buy-in as well, I think, from those, um, those folks at the university, which, which isn't usually a problem, especially on the public policy side, but getting more of the computer science, information technology, um, schools within the universities and colleges, I think are really important. And that's a lot of the work that we're trying to do with CTI. It's just really getting in front of those folks to tell their students that, the, that there are great opportunities within the, the, the federal government um, space. Um, and then I think I was gonna say another thing. Oh, um, just having the folks who've actually had experiences in the federal government or in, pub in the public sector um, talk and be ambassadors to that work, I think is really important. So people who have that career can go talk to their alma maters um, and really kind of uh, be, be speakers and, and go on campus and, and really um, you know, talk about how it's mission driven um, and not um, so much the salary that you're going necessarily in the beginning to go work for the federal government, um, but that you eventually can get a career that's really rewarding uh, and it impacts huge, uh, you know, huge amounts of folks and, and huge scales of people um, as you are um, building your career. Um, and then obviously uh, those folks can also act as mentors. And I think mentorship is a huge, uh, huge part of the success of anyone um, in this field. If you have someone that is helping you, guiding you on your career path, um, and if you find someone who can help you in that because you admire their career, I think students should be looking out for that as well. Thank you, Rick. Uh, so you, you actually mentioned something that I was very curious about and it, it tends to come up in uh, conversations that I sometimes have with, uh, with mentees and, and that is around uh, a salary. Um, it's not that I don't want to you know, pursue a career in public interest, but I worry about, you know, is it going to be on par with what I'm making in the in the private sector? So um, to follow up on that, do you think that there there that there is a pay gap? Um, and if that is the case, what are I guess some ways that we can incentivize students to kind of look at it and frame it differently? So is that directed at me personally? 
Yeah, yes. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I guess I, I guess when I said the salary word, I should have known that this was coming. Um, so <laughs> uh, um, I'll say that I, from what I understand, um, especially in the cybersecurity realm that I've been learning a lot about over the past year and a half, setting up this program, um, I think at the entry level, there is definitely a gap. Um, as you grow in your career and as you get uh, higher up in your level, there's less and less of a gap. So I think that uh, that might be true. So I do think that is a challenge. I think that's something that I would love the federal government specifically to be addressing and fixing um, to make, make entry-level talent more competitive against obviously people like the Silicon Valleys and other private companies out there. Um, but what we do at the partnership, I mean, we, we often talk about obviously the missions of the federal government and specifically each federal agency has its own mission within the federal government that we hope that um, is an incentive to the folks who are interested. So if you go work for the Federal Election Commission or if you go work for the Environmental Protection Agency, you believe in those missions as well, which I think is really helpful. Um, so it's less, less so about the money uh, or the salary, it's really about um, the rewarding experience you're gonna get. Um, and so, but I think what CTI has done is we're, 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 we're helping folks through our different components. So we have a professional development uh, program that they're a part of. So helping them uh, develop in communication skills, in goal setting, in career pathing, in, um, uh, you know, um, all those professional development and leadership skills that we think that they're going to help them um, in the future become cyber leaders. We also have a, a, a technical partner named Cyber Vista who's providing uh, technical training while they're there. So that's all um, part of the program that the agencies don't have to pay for, the um, participants don't have to pay for, it's just baked into our program. So they're going to be developing those technical skills along uh, the NICE framework so that they are marketable going forward to either stay in public service um, or in the private sector or whatever sector they go to, developing their skills that way. So they're getting those um, for free. And then well, I already mentioned the mentorship program. We are connecting them. We have a program that we are connecting each participant with a um, cyber professional in the public or private sector to help them on their career path and give them that development um, to help them talk about what certifications they might need and how to get to where they want to go. Um, so I think, you know, not a lot of um, jobs do that, all of those things. So I hope that that's helping um, them decide to choose this as a career path. Oh, and then finally, sorry, one last thing is if they are selected with a private company, they actually get um, up to $75,000 of their student loan assistance uh, covered. So that is another, obviously, incentive that our program offers. Not every pathway is that way, but it's a great um, selling point for our program. If I may, um, I think what we want to be careful to avoid is equating this idea of uh, public interest technologists needing to be in the public sector, right? And, and again, when we think of public interest tech, not just public tech, right? It's an important distinction because in the grand scheme of things, the vast majority of the next generation technologists will work in the private sector. And I think for public interest tech as a movement, I think it's really important that we are uh, equipping all the future technologists with this public interest tech background and education so that as they go forth in their, pub, in their private sector roles, excuse me, uh, that they do have a grounding and um, are well equipped to kind of take all the considerations that we discuss in this space uh, with them wherever they go. I think that that's a super, super important point, Rob. And, and I think what we're seeing right now, especially at anita.b.org, are technologists who, for a variety of reasons, like living through a global pandemic and a reckoning on racial justice around the world and these huge implications for news consumption and media and election security are all impacting our lives so acutely that what we're really seeing is people start to evaluate the bottom line that their talents are forwarding and, and this calculus of what do I want to achieve in my career has always been more than salary for I think a lot of people and is only becoming more so about what is it that my talents will have an impact in changing. And so I think there's a lot of room um, to talk not just about the salary. And I, and I would say to, to Georgia's point earlier where technologists aren't just folks with computing degrees. Um, a lot of us, I'm an immunologist by training. Um, people tell me I'm a technologist. Um, a transition to the, pu to the to, to public sector was actually a salary increase 
um, from the path I was taking in biomedical wet lab research, um, doing postdoctoral training, right? So I think that there's a lot of nuances in these pathways that technologists are coming from. And, and I think, Rob, like we should just put you on a bullhorn because it's so important that this public interest ethos and this focus on ethics and the intersection of industries and ethics and policies that impact them, um, technologists should be taking that no matter the sector that they're in. Yeah, if I could just jump in as well. I think the other thing is, it may be your first job, the salary might not be the same, but there, there are plenty of high paying jobs in government and in nonprofits. Like, and there's plenty of public data about that if anyone wants to go dig into 990s and learn more about it. So to think that you can't build a, a like well-paid career in this space is actually just wrong. Like you absolutely can. Um, your entry point might not be the same. Uh, and that, you know, I think has a lot to do more with like the way that we understand and look at equity and honestly, some labor issues in the, in the in industry and things like that, that, that we could work on as a, as a community, right? Like maybe nonprofits and governments should have better starting salaries, maybe foundations and grants and things can reward that more and ask to see those levels come up. Those are things that would help in addressing DEI issues as well, like we were talking about before. Um, we need to make it so that these opportunities are not only available to people with the privilege to take those pay cuts when it is a pay cut, and we need to make the pathways to making those careers that are sustainable lives possible, right? Like that's that's something that we need to do across the board. So I and you absolutely can make money. And not only can you make money, you can get your loans forgiven. <laughs> you can um, have maybe a better working schedule. You can have like better equity and have a mission to work with. So actually, I think it's probably where more people should want to be <laughs> if we really want to think about it. If I can also just add plus one all of that, but also say for those of you students that are thinking about whether or not this is a, a career pathway that I might want to take on, whether or not two or three or four or five years or one year um, in government would be a worthwhile experience. We are at a time where if we fast forward 10 years, 20 years from now, government and technology are, are colliding. The, the infrastructure of our daily lives is technology. And so, um, and as we evolve um, as a workforce, the people that are gonna be most successful are gonna be the, inter, are the folks that are most interdisciplinary. The skill set, whether you're working at a tech company or whether you're working in government or whether you're working in civil society or whether you're working at a university that is gonna be really, really important is to be the bridger. Um, and so spending time in government or in public policy to get that education um, so that you can be the bridger, be the translator, be the connector. When we look 5, 10, 20 years out, you are going to be the people that are going to be you know, attached to the CEO's office or the executive director because you will be able to see the forest through the trees um, about how tech is changing society. So this is we view our fellowship program as like a master's degree in how government and public policy works. So I, I think it's important to bring that learning frame to how we think about, how you should think about setting yourself up for a, a career, um, uh, you know, 15 years down the line. I would say it looks like we are without our, our moderator leader for a minute. So I was gonna grab one of the other questions and ask it to everybody if everyone wants. Um, which I, maybe a question is the, how can we ensure, one of the questions that um, was posed to us is how can we ensure investment in placement and students? And it might be a good to talk if folks who are running programs that are about that placement want to build on that question and build on what we're talking about, about career pathways. If anyone wants to take that. So how can we ensure investment in placement and students in programs in public interest tech? Okay. Nobody. <laughs> I, I can hop in there. I, though anyone else working with government, I, I, I think all uh, it's incumbent on us as programs to be really thoughtful about. I'll go back to our test number one for fel for fellowship placement is go to the evangelizers. Um, you want to go to the people that are already trying to solve the hard problems relating to technology and want more tools in their toolbox. So that's one. We have a three part test around this when we think about how we place our fellows. So that's one. Go to the evangelizers. Two is go to the go to the office or the member or um, 
uh, the entity that has the jurisdiction, that has the platform to be able to solve the problems that you want to solve. And so that requires, you know, um, really uh, working hand in glove with the government partners to understand, um, you know, where, where government can affect change. And then uh, I think um, third, our third test is making sure that we as organizations are placing people with organizations where they're going to have, you know, they're going to have a direct line to the to the principal or the boss, um, where they're going to get the resources that they need, where they're going to be, um, uh, where they are going to be seated among, um, you know, among the full time staff and a core member of the team. These are these are things that we as organizations need need to do, um, and then bringing them the support, the networking, the mentorship. There's so much, and this conference is a is a great example of it. There's so much more network building that we can be doing um, to be building this community, and I think it's incumbent on all of us as organizations um, to to make that a core element of of our program. Yeah, and this is Rick. I will say that uh, finding the champions are always is always key to get them to then tell other agencies all about the, uh, the their experience working with the, the participants, which then make them want um, to to uh, to be part of the program. Um, we created an executive advisory council uh, that is comprised of every agency participating and every private uh, company participating at the um, CIO level um, and the Chico level together, so that they are helping us. Um, advise us on improving the program, thinking about what skills are coming up that we should be recruiting for, uh, who we should be talking to, what other groups we should be talking to to make sure that we are incorporating our DEI efforts into the program. So they are very helpful uh, and at a very high level within the federal government and within the um, uh, private company side. So that has been really helpful for us to, to get those champions. Uh, um, and I think um, just helping them think about workforce planning and thinking about how many um, how many opportunities are, are exist that are open and how many of them could be filled by this program specifically. So really thinking about um, reevaluating whether or not the, the higher level positions can be maybe rethought of as, as more of entry level for the a couple of entry level folks um, to help, help uh, fill those gaps that they're missing. Um, and then finally, like Travis said, we're just working to get um, these opportunities. You know, we're doing all the recruiting for the federal agencies. We're doing a lot of the matching and the, and the skill um, and working with the universities directly so that they don't have to. That's saving them time and resources. Um, and so hopefully that is uh, something that's really beneficial to them as well. I think something that doesn't cost money but is very helpful in in this is ensuring that there are campus evangelizers. So it's great to think about our programs and working with agencies and the evangelists inside agencies. But, uh, you know, when I was going through graduate school, it was a secret that I was applying to a, a science policy fellowship and that I was actively looking to transition away from the bench. And so you know, since I've graduated, I've had faculty reach out and ask me to come back and speak as an alumni around my pathway, but that's kind of recent. Um, and so I think it's amazing to have such a strong network of universities in at the Pitt UN network of schools who are focused on this. Um, and how do we get more universities in this network? How do we ensure top down and bottom up on our campuses that this idea of you know, cross-sector, cross-disciplinary know-how being a core utility of a technologist uh, so that we can see the broader impact of our technologies, I think is so critical. And, and that actually doesn't take a lot of money, right? That takes a culture shift um, where the those most elite researchers and faculty who are driving students' interest are including these as critical parts of that conversation. And if I could uh, plus one that, I'll also say that um, while ev evangelizers are so important on campus and students get exposure to them, I think nuts and bolts, ultimately, we need some type of training. We need, whether it's in the formal curricula or whatever it is, uh, we need training. We need hard like education in this space. And I think right now in the public interest tech movement, uh, it's not quite clear not only how to define public interest tech, but also what an education public interest tech looks like. So it's distinct from what's already out there. And I think one of the reasons conversations like this uh, have a lot of promise 
is that as the different you know stakeholders, the various you know academic communities come together and talk about this more, uh, it would be great going forward if uh, more research was done on what would consist of an effective public interest tech education at the college level, right? Uh, having that research done, um, the pedagogy that would be included, uh, these would all be important factors for us to get to the question of then how to actually train the individuals that will then go forth and do the work. Thank you for that. And my apologies, I had some technical difficulties on my end, but uh, <laughs> I'm back with you. And uh, so Robert, I actually did want to follow up on that comment that you made about making the, the, the curriculum um, you know, for public interest technology. Who, who should be involved you know, in that making? Should, should private sector be involved? Should, like, who should be in the room as they're, they're creating these programs? Sure, well, first let me say that, uh, and this is from firsthand experience in the work I do, um, faculty create curriculum, period. Uh, you know, industry and out external partners can help inform curriculum, but ultimately only the faculty and in my opinion, rightfully so, are the ones with the authority to actually create and approve curriculum. So in terms of getting it done, that is almost the only pathway. With that said, there are lots of opportunities uh, that already exist, there's infrastructure for at most colleges, for um, you know, whether nonprofits, whether the private sector, to engage with faculty to help inform their curricula. Uh, this can come in the form of like faculty grants, um, course innovation type grants. Um, there's also a big push for open educational resources and uh, a lot of effort behind that currently uh, to, try to work where faculty and industry work together to develop meaningful curricula. So there is a lot in place already that can be leveraged, but I think that is the way to make it happen. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that. Uh, so I wanted to um, go back on uh, something that was mentioned earlier. So Stephanie, I, I did see in your bio that you um, <laughs> that you you know were in a, another path before you you are in your your current path. And so um, for people who perhaps uh, have a, a wealth of experience in other places, um, how do they make that transition in, into a more public uh, interest uh, technology faced? Uh, you know, kind of role. Uh, Stephanie? I think there's like a, there's a how and a why um, component. And, and certainly the why is I had an interest in being more directly engaged in societal change in a way that I could see immediately. And so my, I went down the single path that I was aware of to make a transition from academic research to policy in STEM. And that was through the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowship. And at that time, I did not even know where to start looking for additional opportunities. And it is only because a prior student that I had known also did this, right, um, that I even knew about the opportunity because it wasn't it wasn't faculty or career counselors or anyone else who was sharing that information at that time. So um, it was word of mouth. And then um, we did start getting some, some foot traffic um, at my university, um, again, from that one singular fellowship pathway. Um, but, but that was the route I took, which was a pathway program where you apply directly to that, right? Similar to Travis's program and Rick. Um, so, so these, these on-ramps into government that then help you learn what it's like to be in government and also start to elucidate all of the pathways by which you might stay. Um, and, and some of those, right, have those transition to FTE um, opportunities and some don't. Um, but it was definitely, uh, to Georgia's point, like the first job, not the last job on that trajectory, um, for sure. Yeah, that's very, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> so I was just gonna say, this is Rick. I worked on the AAA Science Technology Policy Fellowship Program for nine years. Um, so I got to talk to people like Stephanie out in the field. Obviously, as we were talking to students um, for CTI last year, the folks who mostly had an interest or why they showed up to our information session 
uh, was often because maybe they knew someone who'd, who'd worked in the, in the public sector or their parent was a, in the military or a foreign service officer or something and their experience and background led them to that. And I wanna to get to the people who don't think about it. I wanna to get to all the folks who don't think of this as a career path. Where are those? There are so many folks in that, in that, in that space. And I, need to, I think we need to find them, but I specifically as part of my charge is, is looking for those folks and wanting that, them to, to, to know and then, then they can go and spread the word uh, to Stephanie's point earlier as well. Um, but working on those two programs, I've been working in that for, for many years now, and we hear that very often. It's often word of mouth. It's often people who've had that experience, um, and we have so much more outreach to do. I do think, just to jump in, I do think there's a huge opportunity, like Stephanie was mentioning, about having alumni come back and speak at their universities. Um, that feels like a really untapped <laughs> opportunity that we could do more of. Uh, the other place I think it'd be really interesting, and we did this once while I was at the Open Technology Institute, and it actually got us two interns that then, um, I one of them is definitely still in the public interest space, which is cool, not in, um, she's working at like a small organization, but we went to one of the job fairs at one of the universities. So we had our, our director at the time was an MIT alum and um, was willing to spend the money to get us a table. And we were in a back corner and we didn't even get that much traffic at the table, but we did have some jobs that we were able to advertise and we did make two hires out of it. And I really wish, I've, I've always wanted to see that happen more. And it's hard again for small organizations to kind of go to all the job fairs, but could we have a public interest table <laughs> at every job fair where we work on that together? And it's more like sourcing from all of these job lists and maybe there's folks who can speak to the broader sector and we can actually have those opportunities be places that ways can ways that people can come and give back to the university and, and expose those opportunities, right? They, you know, the challenge is frequently those are designed more for industry. So they tend to be um, fundraising events for various clubs and things on campus, but maybe we can carve out a space and also make that a way that we're helping the community as a whole grow and um, give visibility to these opportunities. Thank you, Georgia. Yeah, I, I think it's really important that um, we utilize um, evangelists in, in any you know way, shape, or form uh, to make sure that you know we're spreading the word and we're evangelizing it. And um, there, there was actually something I was thinking about that, that Robert said um, earlier, which was um, just really thinking about really broadening our understanding of what public interest technology careers are. Because I do think to Robert's point, there is a misconception that it's you know only in certain areas. Uh, so uh, Robert, uh, to that point, what can um, what can other organizations, what can private industry do uh, to help kind of broaden that definition of what public interest uh, tech looks like? Sure. Well, I think, and maybe some of you on the panel or some of the those in the audience uh, would be willing to help me out with my understanding of this. But I think, first of all, I'm curious, you know, the role of an evangelist going to campus would be to try to highlight to students why, you know, society has a great need for public interest technologists. Um, I think what I would love to see is, if anyone has it, uh, more data on what does the actual job demand side look like? So for instance, like, is there a specific role I could search for on job sites called public interest technologist, or maybe it's public interest software engineer? Like what are the actual job titles, right? Uh, what information is out there about the different types of roles available to students? And really what is the demand? Like are Microsoft and Google hiring folks specifically for these roles? Or are they really just hiring software engineers the way they usually do? And if on someone's resume, it highlights that they took a class related to, you know, ethics and artificial intelligence, that that's a plus, right? So I think um, there's a lot to do there, uh, just in terms of what does the employer demand data really look like for these roles. Um, and to the extent that, uh, you know, the private sector industry partners would be able to, you know, share such information, um, I think that would be helpful towards that effort. We, we worked on this a bit when I was still at New America, when um, we put out a report, a report called More Than Code, uh, which is still, it's online at morethancode.cc, if folks are familiar with it. And uh, what we ended up doing, we kind of, 
we were trying, we didn't look as much of the data as we uh, would have liked to, because it is hard to get kind of to Robert's point, it would be great to um, get access to some of the data that a lot of these job websites have. Um, and that could help us do some research in this space. But what we did end up doing was based on the terms that people use to describe their jobs and their roles, we actually set up a um, proxy search website that's at jobs.morethancode.cc that lets you search based on the way that people were describing their work against um, job postings on Idealist so that you're not looking for public interest tech and not finding something, but have many words associated with that and are broadening that search so you might find things that you didn't know were there. I think that was our us trying to figure out, we did a little bit of data collection around that and some of that's in the report, but um, I think it'd be, you know, part of the issue Part of the issue that you brought up at the beginning, Robert, is the definitional question of we use lots of different words for this. It might not be specifically a technology role, like sometimes the fellowships aren't on job boards, like it's kind of <laughs> difficult. Um, you have to look in a lot of places, but uh, the thing that we thought was useful about that was at least making it easier for people to potentially find something based on a set of words um, and see what the diversity of options were that were out there. So I, I think there's a I think there's a huge opportunity to expand on that and do more research as well. Absolutely. Uh, I, I I was even doing that in my research, just trying to see well where is like a centralized you know kind of place to find you know these types of roles and you know are people in the private sector you know kind of you know looking you know for the the different facets that make make this up. I, I did want to ask the question, um, and this is open for for anyone. Do you think that um, there needs to be a greater um, awareness of how public interest tech relates? Uh, for the private sector? I don't, I don't have an in, I don't have an answer to that, Suzanne, but I <laughs> think the last question was making me think of examples of private sector work that whether we would or wouldn't classify it as public interest tech, I think the technologists who work on those portfolios would, right? So if you are on the various Amazon teams working to get net carbon zero um, across all of their delivery systems, that requires uh, so many different kinds of engineers, so many different kinds of um, you know, pipeline developers and, and everyone else right across that, that workflow. Um, is that public interest tech or is that, you know, just the better bottom line of Amazon? Um, and so I would, I don't have an answer. I'm just super curious to hear because um, at anitobe.org, we know that the, especially the women who engage in our various communities are deeply committed to ethical technology, whatever the industry it is that they're working on. Um, and so, you know, we're all about, um, coming to some common definitions and, and thinking through how we could get there. But yeah, curious what the other panelists think about that. I have, I mean, one thing that we think about when we've had students work with us um, is it's not, a lot of these issues aren't introduced in traditional parts of the curriculum in schools. So, you know, we work on a lot of privacy and security technologies. Um, we're working with a lot of human rights groups on how to have freedom of speech in different uh, contexts around the world. And that might not be um, a subject that anyone has had exposure to until they were working on a project with us. And so I, I would love to see more folks get that experience and then go and work in a company because the more people we have at Google and Amazon and Facebook that like know about these issues and know about how to learn more about them and the resources available, the better those tools will become and the less we'll have these points of friction where their the technologies are causing societal harm. Right, and, I, and then you may have more people who can flow back and forth more between public and private sector, NGOs and whatnot. Like we need people to be having, getting exposed to what those things mean, to understanding policy. Um, I didn't know policy at all when I landed at New America in my job. And it was a huge and awesome learning experience, right? That was, I, it wasn't something I'd studied before really. Um, and I, now I think, now I'm way more aware of it. And I think about it in all of the ways that we do our work. We all need those intersectional opportunities. So that exposure will make companies better and companies should value it if they see that on people's resumes.
I think it's a huge opportunity. Yeah, and this is Rick, I'll just say that's that's really the model that we're trying to use with CTI is really getting those folks to have this cross-sector experience. We we don't know what people are gonna choose in the long term uh, as a partnership for public service. We are uh, you know thinking that they would go back to the federal government, um, but that's not necessarily true. We, we do expect that I think this uh, maybe more, uh, like when I was taught, when I came out of school, I was taught you're supposed to work at one job or one organization for a very long time. Um, and that's just not the way I think the world works anymore. I think people are looking for a fluid career in many different sectors. And I think you're right, that makes, that makes everyone benefit. I think it's good to be well-rounded. It's good to see all those different perspectives. It's good to work next to diverse people um, who also have you know, different perspectives than you do and can teach you and then you bring it to the next sector that you're going to. Um, so I, I think that that, is, um, that, should, that should be the future. Wonderful. Well, thank, thank you. And I think we're, we're almost at our, our, our time where we'll open it up for a couple of questions and answers from our, our audience. Um, but the, one of the, the, the last questions I, I kind of wanted to, to, to ask to anyone in the panel, um, you know, obviously everyone has been affected by uh, COVID-19 um, in some way, shape or form, uh, some people more so than others. Um, and just thinking about uh, the demand for uh, public interest tech jobs, do you think to any extent has this increased uh, the demand? Has this decreased? Um, what are your thoughts on the effect of the pandemic on, on that demand? Maybe I could share just from my experience uh, with the New York City government uh, during the pandemic. Um, one of the uh, consequences uh, or effects, I should say, of what's been going on has been that from, again, from what I've seen in my own personal experience, uh, virtually anyone within the city government who has some technical skills has been called in to now uh, put them to use and create things that really it's not their job normally doing such things. Uh, I've done this myself, um, but it's been an all hands on deck type of approach to uh, you know dealing with what's been going on in the big picture. And so I don't know that while there's so much being built right now through the city government in terms of like public interest technology, right? Like pandemic response related technology and tools. I don't know that any, I don't know that the majority of folks working on building those tools are public interest technologists. We just happen to be folks who from all kinds of different actual job titles happen to have those skills and have now been called in to put them to use to build such things. When this is over, I think the impression I have is the majority of us will go back to our primary jobs. And um, I don't know that there will be more public interest tech roles necessarily um, in the mix, certainly thinking about uh, budgetary concerns right now, uh, the economic climate more broadly, but um, it'll be interesting to see what happens. I would love to weigh in here because um, we have seen our fellows uh, thrown into the coronavirus response in really, really urgent, impactful ways. They were in Congress for like three weeks when COVID hit. And um, we had one uh, that was put in charge of leading the daily brief for a senior United States Senator. We had one that's authored multi-billion dollar provisions for emergency broadband deployment. We have, we're all on Zoom right now. We, uh, we had one that um, investigated uh, whether the Zoom's claims around end-to-end uh, -end encryption um, were accurate and led to a policy change at Zoom. Lastly, Congress passed the CARES Act and then during the biggest economic and health crisis in three generations, it went silent for six weeks. And that was because the institution did not have the digital infrastructure to function. Uh, so we've launched a, a Congressional Digital Service Fellowship to, to help um, meet some of these urgent needs. It has absolutely, the Zuckerberg hearing was kind of one, like the first wave um, that showed the, the need for technical expertise. This has been the second one. And um, I think it has absolutely illuminated just how critical having a, a, a technologist at the table is um, uh, during this crisis. Just add even more to what Travis said, yes. And I think it's super, it's, it's put a spotlight on the need to have technologists from 
all age ranges and experience backgrounds. So we've seen so many, you know, technical women come out of retirement brushing off their COBOL skills so that they can help um, address, right, some of the aging infrastructures that needed to be managed. And the uh, Travis, I, w- I, w- I would be guessing here, but I would guess most of your fellows were not COBOL programmers. So um, I think that there's, we should like, you know, put some respect on their names or, or what have you, right? Like we, we need technologists with all sorts of skill sets who are coming at this from all sorts of different backgrounds, especially because we're dealing with infrastructures that are aged and, and have these, you know, historic um, uh, baselines, right, that need to be addressed as well. Um, and, and to the point of like, have you seen the need go up? Yes. And we're seeing, I think, the desire of job seekers to be engaged in a way that can prevent these needs from happening in the future, right? We've known about broadband access issues. We've been talking about the digital divide for 20 plus years. Um, we just didn't see fit to address it as a nation until it impacted all of us at this level. So um, I'll leave that there. Yeah, and I'll just add- Does even it in, back to that central? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Rick, Rick, go ahead. Go ahead, Rick. I, I was just gonna say that yeah, just to echo everyone else, it hasn't had a huge impact in terms of the numbers of our participants. We, there's a lot of interest. There's cybersecurity um, breaches still every day um, that need to be protected. So uh, for our program, we're, we're, we still think the future is bright. Yeah, I was gonna say, this really does get back to, I think, uh, the central question of what do we mean by public interest technologist? Because what I'm hearing, right, think of those co- the COBOL programmers, Stephanie, I'm hearing there's clearly a need, if it wasn't already apparent, for technologists. But I think that's maybe a little different than a need for, quote, public interest technologists. And I'm still not sure exactly what that might mean. But, you know, a retiree being brought in because they know COBOL to fix uh, an important like state unemployment system, super important, super necessary. I don't know that I would consider that a public interest technologist though. And I think that's the right. decision that a lot of us continue to try to struggle with. Technologist in public sector versus public interest technologist. Yeah. <laughs> well, everyone, thank you so much. I you know, really enjoyed the, having this discussion with you um, and your, your thoughts and expertise. Um, I would like to take this time now to open up to uh, any questions that the audience may have for any of the panelists. Um, so please feel free to go ahead and uh, share that with us at this time. If possible, um, if, if the Q&A function isn't showing up, you can also send it through the uh, chat function as well. Suzanne, in the meantime, um, if I could just fill in uh, a quiet moment. Um, to the other panelists, I would just like to if you're unaware of this, bring your attention to um, digital government organizations and societies. So for instance, within the higher education world and the academic community, um, there's an entire emerging subfield uh, for digital government research, which almost always includes a pretty significant track on ethical computer science, ethical artificial intelligence, and essentially an ethical technology track within those digital government organizations. So if you are not uh, super familiar with those uh, or want to learn more, then it, it is something I think that might have a lot of promise for all of you in your different work. Wonderful, thank you. So I'm just going ahead and, <clears throat> excuse me, bringing that up for uh, all of us to, to see. Bear with me one moment. And actually, um, just locating the Google document. So, would uh, the production mind sending that link again? Unfortunately, it got to, during my technical difficulty, it got to put away. Thank you.
Okay, so I'm not unfortunately seeing any uh, questions coming up in the, the chat for uh, right now. So I'll just uh, go ahead and um, ask additional questions if that's okay with everybody. Um, so Georgia, how does um, your organization approach uh, capacity building? Um, is it through uh, your program design or through internal hiring practices? Uh, yeah, we um, both. <laughs> and uh, I would say a lot of when we think about capacity, aside from our own sort of internal processes, we also, a lot of what we try to do in the way that we support the communities we work with is around capacity building, whether that's on a project that we're working on and introducing sort of design practices into that, or um, we run uh, actually an open community Slack to help each other connect with each other, uh, help people connect with each other for resources and um, support, peer support and run uh, regular sort of calls to get people introduced to these topics and share as practitioners on how to address issues. But I think we've, as an organization, we've also been thinking a lot about our hiring pathways. Um, and that's where I've been starting to figure out how to explore <laughs> university programs to get us connected to and, um, and how to post jobs that we have to them. Uh, I think that can be I like, and I'm hoping over the next two years that we can um, actually have sort of a regular cycle of um, an internship or fellowship program. Cause I'd love to have folks who either, you know, I, we work with tons of different projects. So either like helping um, students who need uh, ideas for school projects <laughs> or um, having them plug in to actually work with us directly on things. Um, I would love to just always have students who are working with us so that they can get exposure to the type of work and um, have opportunities to stretch those muscles <laughs> and figure out yes. how what the work actually looks like, um, no matter where they take it from there. So that's something we've been thinking about to try and make sure that we always have, um, I mean, to some of what Stephanie was saying earlier, like people of many experience levels on projects. Uh, I think a lot of times nonprofits are pretty under-resourced to be able to do stuff like that, but that's where I think we have a, a pretty good opportunity here, especially, um, I know a lot of universities have programs where students can get paid by the universities to work uh, with nonprofits and, you know, like, we've got projects, <laughs> like, send them my way. <laughs> um, I would love to be overwhelmed, you know, I put it that way. I would love for that to be the problem. I would love to have too many <laughs> students who wanted to work with us. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, so it looks like I've resolved the, the issue. So um, one of the questions that was posed was, what does it mean to be a student in a university partnered with Pitt? What resources and opportunities can a student have from the partnership? And I'll uh, open this question up to anyone. Any takers? <laughs> okay, not, not a problem. Let me, let me just, I can put in a very quick plug, which is just that we, we are gonna be recruiting for um, our Congressional Innovation Scholars Program, which is targeted at early career, um, finishing a master's degree program. We're gonna open up applications for that um, in early December. This network is perfect for us for recruiting. Um, we onboarded six, six scholars in June. They're working for people like Senator Warren, uh, Senator Paul, the Senate Commerce Committee, great, great opportunity. Would love to see um, this network help help us find some great recruits um, for that program. Great, thank you. Uh, so our next question, um, can we talk some of the structural challenges that we, we see across sectors? Like any challenges that we that we see universally? Yeah, I mean, one I think we've talked about a, a decent amount um, on and off, but maybe to make it more explicit is honestly differences in hiring procedures and practices. I think Stephanie, you mentioned like navigating USAjobs.gov is really different, um, or uh, like I've been mentioning, like where and how to post nonprofit jobs on different sites. I think um, that can kind of speak to both procedural differences within the institutions and different practices of hiring, as well as um, language that people are using to describe the type of role. 
So, you know, it might be, <laughs> I feel like when you look at a lot of nonprofit jobs, it's like, please come do everything because you are probably going to get to do a little bit more of everything because it's a smaller organization most of the time. And you might look at a government job and be like, I don't know what these words mean, especially together. And I'm not sure this is for me. <laughs> and the reality is it has more to do with the language that went into the program that maybe led to the job existing. And you, you might just need someone to help you navigate it. But I, I see that as like, maybe a structural barrier that um, people right now are filling with social infrastructure, like support programs and fellowship programs and, and mentorship in that space. I don't know if others have things they want to raise. I think the only thing I'll add is that um, security clearances play a role while you're looking for in the hiring process that you mentioned. So those might take additional time. So a lot of the times in the public sector, I think there's a lot of um, hurdles to overcome, I think is what you're saying. Whereas if you're in the, if you're interested in the private sector, you can get hired pretty quickly just by having an interview, maybe a couple interviews. Whereas with the government, it just takes a little bit longer, but hopefully if that's the direction you want to go, you're finding ways to fill the time while that those processes are working out. I could add in uh, an additional um, uh, systemic challenge, I think, to this, which is that public interest tech to some extent by its nature is multidisciplinary. And within the academic world, you know, students who might pursue a multidiscipline, um, you know, uh, graduate or, you know, undergraduate degree, while that has a lot of benefits if you go out onto the job market once you receive your bachelor's degree, um, within the academic world, um, uh, uh, someone who has a multidisciplinary background uh, to some extent um, is not considered a purist in either of the two disciplines that they've studied. And so uh, at the graduate level and the PhD level, and ultimately when it comes to faculty hirings, um, uh, I find quite often that having a multidisciplinary like you know, PhD, let's say, is actually somewhat of a disadvantage to aspiring academics and faculty because they're not seen as a purist within whatever discipline the job is they're applying to. And so um, as a result, we end up with a lot of faculty who really don't have a multidisciplinary background to teach these public interest tech topics. Uh, and I think that's something that would be great to change at a systemic level. Thank you for that. Uh, so one of the questions that uh, came in uh, had to do with uh, mentoring. So specifically, um, because we're having these representation uh, challenges in the tech industry, um, how does that impact uh, mentoring relationships? Well, that, I can start. I think that um, that was going to be one of my answers to the previous question <laughs> as sort of a common structural challenge across all of these sectors, which is, you know, oftentimes mentorship and sponsorship, which I think we should talk about separately, um, are really organic and happenstance. And if you happen to have a manager that you find to be a mentor like and they have time like you may be able to foster that relationship and I think that that tends to be true anywhere you look what we see is that there are more formal programs and strategies in place in corporate America because of the work that they've been doing on workplace culture um, to set up mentor and sponsorship structures um, than then we are seeing in government so I think government is a bit slow to I implement some of these workplace policies that we're seeing corporate America and private sector places take on. But I would also put academia kind of on that slower side of culture change um, when it comes to strategies around mentorship and sponsorship in terms of having formal systems in place, um, you know, uh, incentivizing folks to serve as mentors and sponsors as well. Um, and would love to hear if folks know of more of that happening in academia and government than I'm aware of. But I think that that is one of the things that we see a bit of a difference in. 
but yeah, also a, a little <laughs> sporadic no matter where you are. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie, unfortunately, we're, we're just at time. So, but um, thank you for answering that question. And, and thank you panelists for your, your time this afternoon. It's been uh, incredibly insightful, incredibly engaging and really driving home the point that uh, the demand is, is there and that there are definitely, there's still work to be done um, and Pitt as well as other you know, organizations and agencies are, are there to, to help facilitate that. Um, with that, thank you all very much for your time and um, please enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>